I've always had a couple of major gripes about using traditional crosscut sleds on the table saw when you want to cut small parts. One is if you're using a stop block, the offcuts will get caught between that stop block and the blade as it creates a pinch point. The other thing is, is that the offcuts will pile up on the side of the blade and they kind of vibrate around. Eventually you just end up with projectiles flying throughout the shop. I think I've actually figured out a solution to all of that and so far it works pretty darn good. Now this is my old small part sled. I've run dados through it. I've used it on both sides. It's just, it's at the point now where it's probably not even safe to use anymore. So today we're going to make a whole new sled from scratch. I'm gonna show you exactly how to build it and exactly how to use it. And as you'll see, it's a super simple design, very minimal material. There is a little bit of inexpensive hardware here though. It's stuff you probably already have on hand or laying around the shop. If you don't already have it on hand, I will leave links in the video description where you can get the exact same things I use to make this if you want to make this exact same design. Now I'm going to make my specific jig out of half inch and three quarter inch Baltic birch plywood. Technically it's 12 millimeters by 18 millimeters, but for the sake of continuity, we're just going to say it's half inch and three quarter. I'm starting off with the three quarter inch material for the fences. I cut two pieces, both at 24 inches long by three inches wide and set them aside. There are two layers to the base of this sled, but the first layer is half inch material and I need to cut this first before cutting the second layer. So I cut this piece to 24 inches by 10 and 3 eighths. This will be the overall footprint of the sled. And while that might seem kind of large for a small part sled, the extra depth will give me plenty of room to work. The extra length will not only give me better material support, will also allow me to use the sled on either miter slot if I want. Now I can cut the final piece, which is going to be cut from three quarter inch stock. Keeping my fence locked down at that same 10 and 3 eighths, I clamp the two fence pieces I already cut to the table saw fence and make a final pass. Doing it this way deducts the overall width of both fences from the overall width of the base and leaves me with a perfectly fitting piece without measuring. Now I can't cut this piece to length yet, so I'm going to leave it a little long for now, but I am going to set my blade to 35 degrees, which I did a horrible job filming, and then I'm gonna trim off one end. Now we'll cut this to its final length here in just a minute. Now is where I could do a dry fit just to make sure I had all my parts right. The half inch base piece goes down first, the fences go onto the front and back, and that beveled three quarter inch piece that we left a little bit long fits snugly right in between the two fences. And it all comes out perfectly square and flush all the way around. That's why I cut the three quarter inch base piece the way that I did. Now I was in a hurry when I built this, so for assembly I used the wood glue CA glue trick. I run a bead of glue along the edge of one of the fences, leaving small gaps in that bead where I can put a few drops of thick bodied CA glue. Then I'm going to spray the edge of the base with CA glue accelerant and sandwich them together. The CA glue and accelerant will cure very quickly and act as a clamp so I can keep moving while the wood glue dries and creates a stronger bond over time. You'll also notice I'm using my table saw fence as a stop to align the pieces that I'm assembling, and I have a small scrap of plywood at the far end of the fence to help flush up the ends. I also have masking tape covering the lower part of my fence to prevent squeezed out glue from getting all over my table saw fence. This setup is honestly pretty foolproof, and it helps a lot when you're working by yourself. After holding the parts together for just a few seconds, I can flip the whole thing around and do the same thing with the other side. I wanted to be able to use this sled with only one miter bar. I also didn't want to run my blade into the screws that I'm going to use to hold the whole thing together. So I positioned the sled upside down so it was centered over one of the miter slots and I locked down the table saw vents just to help keep it in position. Then I could eyeball where I could place screws without being in the path of the blade. Once I had all my holes laid out, I could start countersinking holes for screws. It was at this point that it dawned on me that since I was using only one miter bar, I could potentially use this sled on either side of the blade. On my table saw, both miter slots are just about the same distance from the blade on both sides, so I just roughly mirrored what I had already done on the other end. And real quick, while you're watching me fix my screw up, I wanted to tell you about the latest new offering from Olight, who's an affiliate partner of this channel. This is the Array S2. It's a headlamp with some pretty cool tricks up its sleeve. The Array 2S has both a floodlight and a spotlight, which in itself is pretty unique. And you can use the floodlight by itself, like most headlamps, or use both at the same time. This gives you a whole variation of lighting options from as low as 30 lumens, which will last you about 30 hours, all the way up to an incredible 1000 lumens, which will last you for about four hours. It 
also has low, medium, and high red light options built for nighttime use. The lamp itself tilts to right around 60 degrees, so you can tilt the light and not your head, and it has a 2600 milliamp battery that recharges via USB-C in about four and a half hours. Now, by far the most unique feature about the array is it can be controlled simply by waving your hand in front of it. Wave to the right, the spotlight turns on. Wave to the left, it turns back off. Waving up increases the light output, waving down decreases it. This is pretty handy when you need a little more light and don't wanna get your dirty hands all over your face and light when you fumble around for the switch. Now, Olight's having a flash sale that starts from about the time of this upload to midnight tomorrow, so it's a small window. There's discounts on all sorts of stuff, but if you can't check that out right now, you can always save 10% at any time using the link in the description and using the code INSPIRE10 at checkout. Thanks so much to Olight and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now let's get back to making that small part sled. In my case, I'm actually reusing the miter bar off my old sled. That would be the miter slider SE from Incra in an 18 inch length. They're fully adjustable. They glide super smooth once you get them dialed into your saw. I didn't see the point in making a miter bar since I already had this one, but you could definitely go that route too. I double checked that I was still centered and then eyeballed where the two mounting screws would land that will fasten the sled to the miter bar. Then I marked the top face of the bar to tell me where the outside edge of the sled needs to land. Once I lay the sled on the bar, I won't be able to see where the screw holes are anymore and this mark will act as a reference. I put a couple of washers down in the miter track and then slid the bar into place. This will raise the bar up just slightly above the surface of the table saw. Now I could put a few pieces of double side tape on the face of that bar and position the sled over it, lining up that outside edge with the pencil mark, and then you just press it down to get the bar to stick to the sled. Now I can simply slide the whole thing out as one piece and flip it over. I drilled small pilot holes in the center of the two mounting screw holes from the bottom all the way through to the other side. And I mean like a 16th of an inch small pilot holes. You don't want the pilot holes too big or you'll have a heck of a time with the next step, which is to flip the whole thing over and drill recesses for the heads of the mounting screws. I find that this works best with a Forstner bit, but Forstner bits don't usually work well by hand if you're trying to drill into an existing hole but we need to drill the pilot holes to tell us where the mounting screws need to be. So usually the smaller the pilot hole, the better. Once the recesses are drilled, I flip the sled over and drill for the screw shaft itself, and then I loosely attach the miter bar. Now my table saw is pretty well tuned, so when I'm making sleds like this, I typically just trust my fence to help me square my sled to my miter bar. If you don't happen to have as much faith in your saw, you may have to go about squaring your sled up to your miter bar a different way. But for the sake of this video, this is the way I'm going to do it. Once I thought I had it where I wanted it, I simply tightened the screws, gave it a few buttery smooths back and forth, made a shallow first cut, and then checked it for square. I mean, it looks pretty square to me. Plus, this is a small parts jig. There's no reason to get crazy here. Now, this is a pretty slick, small crosscut sled at this point, but I wanna make this thing an epic small parts sled. And this is where our three quarter inch second base comes into play. That's going to go right inside of here, bevel up just past the blade. That's the part that's going to funnel small offcuts away from the blade. I lined up the second base so that the entire bevel was just past the blade, like about an eighth of an inch or so. Once I had it where I wanted, I just made a mark at the end and then I trimmed it to length. I wanted to be able to replace the secondary base if need be, like if over time the kerf widens out or something. So to secure it to the sled, I'm using double side tape to hold it in place and screws to mechanically fasten it. I brushed out any debris, flipped it over and set it in place, flushing it up with the leftmost side of the sled. Then I pressed it all down firm and flipped it over to pre-drill holes for wood screws. On the end with the bevel, you can only go over about a quarter of an inch from the saw kerf and still have plenty of material to bite into on the bevel. Any farther than that and you may end up running screws right through to the other side and you'll have them poking out on the inside of the sled. You can put screws wherever you want in the rest of the sled, but keep in mind that if you want to use the sled in both miter slots, don't put them in the path of the blade. While I had the drill handy, I figured this would be a good time to install a piece of T-Track on the top of the front fence. Now I used to avoid T-Track at my builds because of the cost, but it's kind of imperative for this sled to be able to function properly. So I'll put a link in the description of the stuff that I used here. It isn't shiny blue or red, but it gets the job done and it's way more cost effective. You can also get the T-bolts and knobs that I'm going to use for the stop block here as well. Speaking of the stop blocks, I lucked out and had some hard maple scraps that were just the right size, which in this case is three quarter inch by three quarter inch square, or 
close. I drilled a quarter inch hole in the center of the last two inches of that maple square, cut said two inches off, and then cut one more piece three inches long. While at the saw, I also cut up this eighth inch tempered hardboard for the other stop block. In my case, I cut one piece at three and three eighths by three inches and the other one by an inch and three quarter by three inches. These pieces don't have to be exactly these dimensions. We'll talk about that here in just a second. It's just what I ended up cutting mine to. This'll make more sense as we go. I use the same green tape on the table saw fence trick to assemble the second stop block. CA glue alone is plenty strong enough to hold all this together. I'm basically just making a sandwich with the maple in the center. They just need to be flush on the ends and against the fence. Again, this will make more sense here in just a second. This second stop block is kind of hard to explain. This is the hardware pack that I mentioned earlier. This is a kit with a ton of knobs and T-bolts and threaded inserts to make pretty much whatever jig you can think of. I'm just using one of the quarter 20 by two inch T-bolts and one of the small knobs for the first stop block. The second stop block doesn't even need any hardware. Okay, now if there were any confusing bits in there, like my whole explanation of the second stop block altogether, this is where everything is going to start to make sense. To use this, all you have to do is slide a ruler past the blade to whatever measurement you need, like let's say a half inch. While holding the ruler firmly in place, slide that second block over to the ruler until it touches it, then slide the first stop block over it until it makes contact with the second stop, then tighten the knob. Once it's tightened down, it'll be set at that same measurement from here on out until you change it. In this example, I need to cut several half inch pieces of small dowel. After squaring up the end of the dowel, I move the sliding stop over until it makes contact with the non-sliding stop. I scoot the dowel over until it makes contact. I move the sliding stop out of the way and I make my cut and then rinse and repeat. There's zero chance of a piece getting caught between the blade and the stop block. There's also zero chance of the pieces piling up near the blade and I can make accurate, repeatable, same size cuts to my heart's content safely and efficiently. And as a bonus, my hands are never in harm's way either because they never have a chance to be in the path of the blade. Now, I absolutely love this design. It fixes everything I hated about cutting small parts on the table saw to begin with, and it just makes it so much more safe and efficient. Now, a couple of clarifications because I know you guys are gonna ask a couple of things specifically. You do not have to use hard maple for these stops. I did want to use a hardwood because I wanted the longevity of the denser wood, but it just also happened to be what I had here in the shop. So you could use plywood or basically anything else. Just keep in mind that the softer woods are gonna wear out faster and it might be harder to drill into a softer wood and not have it split apart on you on that narrow three quarter inch. You could also put a screw into one of these stop blocks or the other. And by doing so, you would have a micro adjust. So you can get to a very specific measurement. You could tighten or back out that screw depending on if you wanted to increase or decrease the size of the pieces that you're cutting. You also don't have to use tempered hardboard for the pieces either. I like using it because it's thin and it's smooth and it's cheap. So it slides really easy and it's lower profile. So my hand isn't gonna cramp up if I have a whole bunch of parts. If you make it out of thicker material, you got a really bulky thing to hold on to here. But again, you can use whatever you want. You can make the sizes of the fronts of this, whatever dimensions you feel appropriate too. But keep in mind, the shorter you make this, the less chances you have of running really thin stock in here. So the taller this gets, the more thin stock is just going to slide right underneath it. Uh, one more thing too, you could also put a track in here with a clamp. I know a lot of people try to uh, like to do that. I didn't because I personally find it cumbersome to reposition a clamp with every cut, but to each their own. I think the beauty of having that replaceable three quarter inch piece is that at any time, if you want to upgrade, if you want to change it out, like I say, if the curve starts to widen out, you don't have to make a whole new sled. You can just replace that piece. Anyways, I think that's about it. Let me know if you guys build this sled and what you do to improve it. Thanks so much for watching as always. We'll see you guys in the next video.